Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for our message this morning is taken from our gospel reading, Mark chapter 9. We'll look at verse 8, where it says, Suddenly they looked around, and Moses and Elijah were gone, and only Jesus was with them. Dear friends in Christ, was Peter out of his mind? I mean, what on earth was he thinking? Here he is, witnessing one of the most spectacular heavenly visions ever given to man. Jesus is being transfigured right there before his very eyes. You know, by the way, we often skip over that word transfigured, but it would serve us well to delve just a bit deeper into what it means when the Bible says that Jesus was transfigured before Peter, James, and John. You see, the word transfigured means a change in appearance, but not just any sort of change, huh? -uh. Rather, an extraordinary change, like something out of a special effects Hollywood blockbuster movie. Jesus, you see, he underwent a metamorphosis. In fact, that's what the word means in the original language. It's, it's metamorphosis. The gospel writers tell us that his, his face, it changed appearance. It was, it was like the bright sun. And his clothing became incredibly white. Those of you who do the laundry might say, as, as Mark does here in our gospel reading today, that Jesus' clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. You see, for, for one wonderful moment, Jesus allowed his divinity to visibly radiate his glory. And wow, what a spectacular sight it must have been. And what is more, things only got better up there on this Mount of Transfiguration. For alongside Jesus, there appeared from the past Moses and Elijah. Now friends, over the centuries, artists around the world have tried to capture this glorious moment of our Lord's Transfiguration. In fact, let me show you some of their attempts at, at trying to capture this. I have a few of these to, to share with you this morning. I tell you the artist names, but you know they have Italian names and French names, and I'm not real good at pronouncing all of those. I know that one is this artist named Raphael. He, he painted that one. Well, there you have it. Now those are certainly some lovely paintings. But you know the truth is one cannot begin to fully comprehend the, the true marvel of this spectacular sight. No, it, it simply, as we say, transcends our understanding. So back to my original question though. Was Peter out of his mind? What was he thinking? What I mean by that is Peter wants to try and capture this moment, you recall, by putting up three shelters. One for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. You know, Bible scholars, they have, de they have debated over the, the centuries what exactly Peter had in mind when he made this suggestion to put up these three shelters or more accurately, three tenths. And one possibility for us to consider is the fact that back in ancient times, shelters or tents were regarded as the habitations of divine beings. Therefore, here's the question for us to consider. Was Peter's offer to build these three shelters actually his way of trying to venerate 
or worship these three great figures. You know, if so, then Peter was making a big mistake. Yes, a very big mistake indeed. For if Peter thought of putting Moses and Elijah on the same level as that of Jesus, then Peter clearly failed to recognize, at least in this incident anyway, Jesus' true rank of being in the number one spot. Now, friends, I realize that what I just said there may come across as a bit shocking because, yeah, you did hear me correctly. I am suggesting the possibility that Peter might be putting other people like Moses and Elijah and other things on par with the Lord Jesus Christ. And let's face it, that kind of flies in the, the face, does it not, of our image of Peter being the rock of faith. You know, him being one of the great giants of the church, the chief disciple, the man of whom we have named this congregation after, the man who, who just six days earlier before this transfiguration event had confessed Jesus as being the Christ, the Son of the living God, he confessed. But my friends, whereas Peter certainly warrants our respect and our admiration for the, for the good confession that he made and the good things he had done as a result of that confession, at the same time, let's keep in mind that Peter was also a sinner. Yes, a sinner just like each one of us here today. Scripture, you know, never tries to hide or, or cover over the shortcomings of Peter or, or of, of people. And Peter, just like us, had his faults. And one of those faults, among many, may have very well been the tendency to, to elevate other people and other things to the same status or level as that of Jesus Christ himself. But hey, whether Peter was attempting to do that or not, when he suggested setting up these three shelters there at the Transfiguration, who really knows? I mean, such speculation, it, it might be interesting to discuss at a Bible study or something like that. But beyond that, who really cares, right? All we do know is that whatever Peter had in mind there at the transfiguration, it wasn't very wise. In fact, Luke's gospel makes the point of saying that Peter did not know what he was saying. But let's move past that for a moment. And let's bring this closer here to where you and I are today. What about us, my friends? Do do we ever elevate people and, and things to the same status or level with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior? You know, probably most of us here today would say that when it comes to what is most important to us in our lives, why most of us would say, oh, Jesus, he holds the number one spot, right? Right? Usually when asked, people, especially Christians like you and me, will list their priorities in this order. God is first. We say that very proudly. God is first. What's second? Family, right? Usually we put family there. And then other things we'll say like maybe work, friends, financial security, and so forth. They follow behind, usually distantly behind. Now that always sounds so good when we say that, but is that really an accurate ranking of our priorities in life? I mean, if someone were actually to follow us around through this coming week, watching our, our every day, our every hour, our every minute, is that what they would see in us? That kind of priority in our life? God first? Does the Lord Jesus Christ really hold that number one ranking in our lives? Or have we in reality put other things 
you know, on par with him, thereby failing to give him his rightful position. You know, it's interesting to note that after the cloud enveloped them there on the Mount of Transfiguration, and that voice from heaven boomed out, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. It's interesting to note what then happened in verse 8. Reading again from the New Living Translation of the Bible, it says, suddenly they looked around. And Moses and Elijah were gone, and only Jesus was with them. You see there what happened? Moses and Elijah, they faded away. They were gone, and only Jesus was left. Dear friends, there in verse 8 we discover why elevating anyone or anything at the same level as Jesus is so futile. It's so silly because in the end, when all is said and done, only Jesus matters. Only Jesus endures. And the reason only Jesus matters is because He is the only true Savior. Yes, He is the only one who can truly rescue us from all the troubles that we face in this world. Think about it. I mean, let's just contrast here for a moment these other guys, Moses and Elijah with Jesus. Moses was a lawgiver. Remember that? He's the one whom God used to deliver to us the commandments. And yet, who among us here today has been able to keep those commandments as we should? Who among us here today has put God first in everything? Has kept His name pure? Has worshipped Him perfectly? Who among us has loved our neighbor as we should? No, as it says in the book of Romans, it is through these commandments, it's through the law, that we become aware of the fact that we are poor, miserable sinners. And in no way can the commandments, can the law save us from that sin. So Moses fades away. And then there's Elijah, the great fiery prophet. I say fiery because Elijah, you may recall was the one who in several instances in the Old Testament would call down fire from heaven to consume and destroy. In other words, he brought judgment upon people. Now friends, judgment is certainly what you and I deserve on account of our sin. But at the end of the day, does judgment do anything at all to bring us closer to God? Does judgment really reform us and rescue us from the awful plight of sin? Hardly. No. Only Jesus. Only Jesus can rescue us from the troubles we face in this world. For what the law could not do, what judgment cannot do, only Jesus has done. And you know something, beginning this coming Wednesday, Ash Wednesday as we call it in the church year, we will witness once again how Jesus accomplished our rescue, our salvation, as we begin the Lenten journey. The journey that takes us to his cross, to his suffering and death, and then finally to his resurrection. You know, it's tempting to skip that journey of Lent and to not take it, especially that cross and suffering and death part of it. Yes, it's tempting to perhaps, well, think like Peter maybe, where, you know, we, we build shelters and we settle down into what we might view as a glorious life where we can, yeah, we can have our Jesus, yes, but 
have him right alongside all the other amenities that we might think make for a good life. But friends, the reality is that will not work. It will not work because only Jesus is the true God. And only God can save you and me from our sin. Everyone and everything else will eventually let us down. Everyone and everything else will eventually fade and pass away. Only Jesus can be relied upon. So whether life is good, grand, and glorious, and I hope it is for you, I do, sincerely, or if it is depressing, dire, and down, remember, in either case, only Jesus can save you. And the only way we get Jesus is through faith. Yes, simple, trusting faith in what he has done for us and for our salvation there upon the cross. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.